A warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. Thanks again for joining us. We begin with growing concern over the Gaza Strip as Israeli shelling and airstrikes continue. The UN says at least 12 people have been killed, 75 of them injured when a UN facility sheltering civilians was struck in Han Yunus in southern Gaza. According to UNRWA, two shells hit its Han Yunus training center during fighting in the city's western outskirts. The commissioner condemned the blatant disregard of the basic rules of war. In the meantime, health officials in Gaza say at least 20 people have been killed, 150 others injured as Israeli tanks fired shells and live rounds at people in northern Gaza city who lined up to receive much-needed humanitarian supplies. The UN says heavy fighting has encircled two hospitals in Han Yunis, Nasser and Al-Amal, leaving thousands of terrified staff, patients and displaced people trapped inside. Also, the Palestinian Commission for Prisoners and Ex-Prisoners Affairs says Israeli authorities are tightening their grip on detainees in the Negev prison, making their lives unbearable. More from the UN, the humanitarian official in Gaza says the shock of Israeli attacks is starting to wane. Jamie McGoldrick was briefing journalists in New York about how UN staff and their families were trying to get through the humanitarian situation there. He reported the attack on the Onward Training Center in Han Yunus, which had been sheltering at least 10,000 people. He noted that humanitarian agencies bring in 250 trucks a day into Gaza was a good day. The shock is actually starting to wane now and people start to see themselves a resignation that this is this is what they're going to have to face for some significant time. And we in the international, the UN family and its partners are trying the best we can to get through, but we are faced with massive challenges. Many of them are outside our, our control. Uh, massive numbers of civilians have arrived in, in uh, Rafah itself, which is on the border with Egypt. The fleeing hostilities in different parts of, uh, of Gaza. Um, you see uh, we've got serious issues of overcrowding in the streets, uh, people building shelters, erecting tents. Uh, the squalid conditions you see inside the shelters and inside these areas um, is over the, the unsanitary conditions. There's people using contaminated water and there's sort of as outbreaks of respiratory infections, of hepatitis A, diseases that were uh, eradicated from Gaza before. There was a, 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 an attack on a, an UNRWA training centre in Khan Yunus. It's been sheltering 10,000 displaced people and they've just been hit recently in the afternoon just now and we're see mass casualties have taken place. Some buildings are ablaze and um, they're reported of deaths. Many people are trying to flee the scene but unable to do so. Uh, we, are, we are getting in about 250 trucks a day, that's on a good day, and that's coming through one point which is Rafa. And all of the goods that are being from Rafa, from Egypt side through to Kerem Shalom. And so what we have there is the only entry point in there. And right now, the only stuff we have is the humanitarian. In the past, you would normally have about 500 trucks per day from the private sector bringing in basic commodities. And that's having a massive impact on the population. And by tomorrow, all eyes will be on the International Criminal Court as it delivers its highly anticipated verdict on South Africa's request for an interim ruling in its genocide case against Israel. If granted, the ruling would probably take the form of an order to Israel to announce a ceasefire in Gaza and allow more UN humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. South Africa's Foreign Minister Naledi Pando is flying to The Hague to be present at the ruling tomorrow. Some say the announcement of her travel plans does not necessarily mean that South Africa knows the verdict will be in its favour, but does reflect a confidence in Pretoria that their request is going to be met at least partially. Let's bring in former Christian Zionist Pamela Ngubani to analyze this. Pamela, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Right, so where do you think the pendulum will swing tomorrow? I think it will swing significantly towards what South Africa is asking for. Probably not all the way. Um, but there definitely has to be an admittance 
by the International um, Court of Justice that the United Nations has been adamant that what is going on in Gaza right now is a genocide, not just from weapons of mass destruction, but also from a lack of food, a lack of sanitation, a lack of water, a lack of adequate housing, a lack of warm blankets. It's winter right now. There, it's like the height of winter, and so um, and and because South Africa used the United Nations first, uh, leaders in the different uh, portfolios that the United Nations has to make its case for a genocide which goes beyond a military offensive against the Palestinian people. Um, I don't think that the courts of the United Nations can um, ignore its own evidence that what's going on in Gaza at the hands of Israel is a genocide. Right, in South Africa's uh, uh, Foreign Minister Naledi Panda, as we said earlier, is on her way to the ICJ. Some say it doesn't mean she knows the verdict will be in South Africa's favour, but you will agree it's a very bold move by the minister and by the country. Uh, what message do you think she is trying to pass across with her presence at the ICJ? I think she's trying to show that South Africa, from its most humble and ordinary citizen who's out in the streets waving the Palestinian flag in support of the Palestinian people, all the way to the top echelons of the government of our country, stand with the Palestinian people. She herself, um, as a Muslim woman, is privy to the gross Islamophobia which underpins Zionism, both Jewish and Christian Zionism. And so she's also, I believe, sending a message to the Muslim world that Islamophobia will no longer be tolerated and that we as South African people stand with all people who are oppressed. We don't care if you are Jewish or Muslim or Christian or no faith or Hindu or whatever. If you are oppressed and you are being oppressed um, with seeming impunity, like the people of Palestine are being oppressed by Israel, South Africa will stand with you. And it's also showing that in the global South, South Africa is a leading country in the global South. When we got our independence from apartheid in 94 and our first general elections and we voted in Nelson Mandela, the world was amazed by the fact that we were able to overcome such an oppressive, racist, brutal regime by peaceful means and by democracy by the same democracy that the West is so proud of itself um, as espousing its values. They even claim to have invented it, you know. Um, but here we are, South Africa, using the tools of democracy, using the tools of diplomacy and dialogue to achieve the goals of peace and harmony amongst human beings. We're not all going to get along. We're not going to all like each other. We all have different beliefs. But as human beings, we have the responsibility to try and get along. And the Global South represents that. You know, until 1492, when Christopher Columbus left Europe to go to the Americas, people across the world were living in a culture very much like the Ubuntu culture that we have here in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, and when the West came with their colonization, even going so far as to say that the Bible justifies it, justifies slavery because of this manufactured narrative of the curse of Ham, which has been shown to be in addition to the Torah, it's not actually like the words of God. Um, we then all, the whole world, became subject to this colonial system. And, you know, the global south is showing the world that it's had enough. They've got, we've gained nothing from this oppression. Um, yes, we can talk about the technology, but where did it come from? It came from the global south's ideas that were implemented by the global north. You know, and so decolonization is the agenda of the African National Congress. And, and this is why when Durban was host to the 2001 World Conference Against Racism of the United Nations, South Africa led that conference by saying that we will oppose racism, oppression, and we want decolonization to mean something real. It must mean get out of our countries and leave us alone, leave our mineral resources to us and give us reparations and have the decency to treat us with the respect that we deserve as human beings. And so I think this is a continuation of that ethos 
And it is a continuation of what Nelson Mandela said, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people because the Palestinian people are experiencing colonization in real time. It must be arrested. The rest of the world, the time has passed. The colonization has happened. I mean, for us, it was in 1879 when the last uh, Zulu, when the last African king in, in our region was arrested, you know. But in Palestine, it's happening in real time and we need to arrest it and stop it as we speak. Right. And as a former Zionist, I know you will have, you know, a lot of respondents vying for the support for, you know, Palestine. But do these supporters acknowledge the attack by Hamas on Israel on October 7, 2023? Yes. And they acknowledge it in the framework that an occupied people has a right to resist with armed resistance. That's why the African National Congress created Umkonto Esizwe, which was the military wing of the African National Congress. Similarly, in Ireland, which had been colonized by the English since about the 1100s, with it ramping up century after century, Sinn Féin had the Irish Republican Army. You know, similarly in Algeria, there was uh, uh, an armed uh, opposition. The PLO had an armed opposition. So it is a guaranteed right in international law and in the laws of human decency that if you're occupied, your land is being taken away from you, you're being brutalized by a brutal racist settler regime, you have the right to actually bear arms and defend yourself. And that's what Hamas did. You know, we need to acknowledge that just because the West finds something distasteful and they don't like it, doesn't mean that it has to, it's the truth that it is a distasteful, unlikable thing. What Hamas did was standing up for its people. Yes, some people, some civilians were killed by Hamas, but at the same time, Israel is on record as acknowledging that they killed their own people, as well as Israeli hostages acknowledge that some of the hostages were killed by Israeli gunfire. Even now in Gaza, there were three young men killed with T-shirts off, waving white flags with SOS written on them, killed by the IDF. So the IDF is in disarray. They panicked. They killed their own people. And they even have something called, um, I can't remember what the name is, the Hannibal Doctrine which says that they would rather kill their own personnel than allow them to be taken prisoner by Hamas because they know that Hamas will use them for prisoner exchanges and that the Israelis will give up a lot of Palestinian prisoners to get back one or two uh, soldiers. So they would rather have them dead. And this is even told by a man whose own daughter, I think she was eight or 10 years old, he said it would have been better if she was dead than for her to have been part of the prisoner exchange at the hostage exchange with Hamas, you know? So it permeates the whole society. And, you know, Israel has a lot to do. That's why the, the, secu the, the Secretary General of the United Nations said, October 7th did not happen in a vacuum. There's a background and there's a context which must be respected. These people are under oppression and they have the right to fight back. Right, and Pamela, what if, you know, the ICJ rules against South Africa. Is that a possibility considered by those supporting Palestine and by proxy Hamas? What do you think the reaction might be? Look, when Hamas took up arms against Israel on the 7th of October, they didn't ask for permission from the United Nations or from anyone to stand up for their rights. So whatever the ICJ rules, Hamas is going to continue to stand up for the rights of the Palestinian people. And those of us who stand with the Palestinian people will continue to stand with the Palestinian people. And if the ICJ rules against its own self, because it's the court of the United Nations, so if it rules against its own self, then it must just disband. Then, it, then it's just showing itself to be not a credible organization. And the global south would do very well to start creating its own multilateral fora to replace the United Nations, because clearly it's a tool of imperialism if it's going to vote on the side of Israel. Right. Thanks again, Pamela, for your time today. Thank you so much and good evening to your listeners.